Hello, everyone. Uh, before I uh, introduce myself and introduce our speaker, I wanted to let everyone know that um, this webinar is being recorded. So I just wanted everyone to know this. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Sousan Abdel Rahim. I'm the inaugural fellow in the Palestine Program in Health and Human Rights at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights in the Harvard School of Public Health. We're delighted to host this talk by Dr. Anne Adfan as part of a series of talks organized by the Palestine Program. Uh, we have one more seminar or webinar this uh, semester in December. Uh, please check our website. We will put the website um, in chat uh, for our upcoming webinars and programs. Let me introduce Dr. Adfan. Um, She's a lecturer in interdisciplinary race, gender, and postcolonial studies at University College London. She researches displacement in modern Palestine and has published award-winning articles in the Journal of Refugee Studies, Journal of Palestine Studies, and Jerusalem Quarterly. She has also contributed her expertise on Palestinian refugee history to the Washington Post, the New York Times, The Nation, and Al Jazeera. She's the author of the book that is the subject of today's webinar, Refuge and Resistance, Palestinians and the International Refugee Regime. regime. Um, I'm sorry, the International Refugee System, which is out with uh, Columbia University Press. In the chat, we're going to also um, put a link for um, how you can order the book and get a discount if you order it through the publisher. In the words of a reviewer, this book is, quote, groundbreaking international history of Palestinian refugee politics, end quote. The book's main thesis is that Palestinian refugees are, and have always been since the Nakba of 1948, political actors and not nearly aid recipients. Irfan narrates the history of Palestinian refugees interwoven with the history of the birth and, and development of the humanitarian agency UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. There's perhaps no more stark moment than the one we are currently living to articulate what it means to be a Palestinian refugee and to critique the meaning of humanitarianism and humanitarian aid. Despite the death and destruction that we have been witnessing for the past 32 days or more, um, this experience has proven yet again that for better or for worse, Palestinian refugees are political actors. They are not um, what uh, Noura Araqat described as um, uh, perfect victims and defy this violent demand for perfect victims. In the words of Angela Davis, Palestine remains a moral litmus test for the world. Um, refugee identity, humanitarianism, internationalism, nationalism are all concepts and frameworks with which Arfan's book engages with. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Arfan, and thank you all for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, Sersen, for hosting, for inviting me to come and speak today. Thank you to all of the uh, team who've made this event possible, and thank you to all of the attendees for being here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, coming from London, where I'm joining you from. Uh, before starting, I have to briefly apologize that I am coming out of a cold, so my voice is swooping in and out, but I will do my best to keep it going for the next hour or so, and if you see me drinking water, that is the reason. I am going to uh, first share my slides. Hopefully, that should work fine. Um, Sausan, are you seeing that okay? Yep. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So I would like to start by mentioning probably the obvious fact that we first spoke about organizing this event a few months ago now, and I researched and wrote this book even further into the past than that. And of course, since then, things have changed immeasurably and very significantly for the worst on the ground in Palestine, particularly most obviously, but not only in Gaza. 
However, at the same time, I would also argue that unfortunately we are seeing significant continuities and consistencies with what's happening in Palestine, particularly Gaza today, and with the longer history that I focus on in this book. So hopefully what I'm going to talk about today, although I come at this as a historian, and although the book is grounded in historical analysis, it will hopefully have a lot of resonance for bigger conversations we might want to have about the current moment. The book is entitled Refuge and Resistance, and I argue throughout, and Selsan alluded to this in her introduction, that refuge and resistance are really the twin pillars of Palestinian history in the modern era. As a people, they have been forced time and time again to find refuge, but simultaneously they have fought against the structural constraints that have been placed on them as a dispossessed stateless population. They have resisted in various ways these constraints, and they have time and time again, demonstrated their agency and sought to situate themselves as political actors and not merely either victims or militants. So this is the core thesis of the book. The subtitle, Palestinians and the International Refugee System, refers to the core relationship, the core dynamics that I examine throughout the book. The push-pull that we've seen over the last 75 years between these actors, on the one hand, Palestinian communities in the modern Middle East, and on the other hand, what I call the international refugee system, what is sometimes called the global refugee regime, which refers to the international institutions, norms, instruments, conventions that were put together in the period after the Second World War, and that were institutionalized particularly via the United Nations, which was created in 1945. Now, this is particularly significant in the case of the UN, because the late, sorry, in the case of Palestine, because as the late 1940s saw the establishment of this series of events, it simultaneously, of course, saw the creation of the Palestinian refugee crisis via the Nakba which is most associated with 1948, but which in reality took place over a longer period. Speaking about the Nakba as an event, although it is also a structure, what we're referring to here, as I would imagine this audience is well aware, is the dispossession, displacement, dispersal of around three quarters of the Palestinian population as a result of the establishment of the State of Israel on 78% of what had been Palestine in 1948 and its establishment by militant means. This led most of the Palestinian population to go into exile, either as a result of direct expulsion via ethnic cleansing or fleeing for fear of massacres helping massacres taking place nearby. So it was either direct or indirect expulsion. And it's also worth noting that of the roughly 100,000 Palestinians who remained in the 78% that became Israel, the vast majority of them were also internally displaced. So we are talking about a fully displaced population here. Now, the other thing that it's worth, that's worth noting is that we can draw a direct line between the events of 1948 and the events of 2023, not only in the echoes we're seeing today of mass displacement, but also in the demographics of Gaza. More than 70% of people living in Gaza today are themselves Nakba refugees. And if you want to understand why Gaza is so severely overcrowded, well, its population more than trebled as a result of the Nakba. So there is a direct line from then to now. And one final thing I'll add here before moving on is that if we say more than 750,000 Palestinians were made refugees in 1948, over the last month in Gaza, the number of people displaced already dwarfs that. So that gives us some sense of the momentousness of what's happening now. Now, if we look at early images of Palestinian refugees as a result of the Nakba, there is no doubt that they were victims. They were victimized by what happened to them. But I would argue if we look at these images, we also see evidence that they were survivors. And these images bring to mind not only these twin pillars of refuge and resistance that I talk about, but they also bring home the argument made by one leading refugee historian that refugees are fundamentally people who rescue themselves. They are fundamentally people who demonstrate agency, even though they are then generally constructed in the Western imagination as victims, sometimes victims at best. In the aftermath, the worst off Palestinian refugees, 
ended up seeking shelter in camps that were springing up across the neighboring Arab states and in the two parts of Palestine not taken by Israel, so the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And you can see in both of these images the early presence of the UN regime, which I'm coming to as the main focus of my talk here. So on the left, you see a group of Palestinian refugee men around 1950, queuing, standing in line outside the UNRWA Russian Distribution Center in Aida camp in the West Bank, which still exists today. And on the, in the other picture, you see similar dynamics happening at a food distribution center in Gaza, which was serving two refugee camps, both of which have been hit by Israeli bombs in the last two weeks. Now, what is the agency at play here? I would imagine it is familiar to most of this audience, but when I speak about the international refugee system in the Palestinian context, I'm referring when it comes to the UN to a very particular wing body agency of the UN, namely this one. So the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, better known by its acronym of UNRWA, UNRWA or UNRWA. So UNRWA is, the overarching wing of the UN refugee regime as it functions for Palestinian refugees. It was established at the end of 1949, so just four years after the UN itself came into being and just one year after the Nakba. And it was created by a resolution that was passed by the UN General Assembly at the time and given a very simple mandate. So UNRWA was mandated to carry out direct relief and works programs for Palestine refugees in collaboration with local governments. And what's more, it was mandated to do this in a geographically limited area in what's known as the five fields of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, this mandate might look very straightforward and in many ways it is, but I think even just looking at these two bullet points can tell us a lot about the more complicated dynamics that are at play here. UNRWA is set up only to provide relief services, relief and works programs. In other words, its work directly constructs Palestinian refugees on the basis of humanitarian need, on the basis of socioeconomic relief. There is no acknowledgement or no recognition in UNRWA's mandate and in the regime that springs from it that Palestinian refugees have a political uh, sensibility to their fundamental status and identity as displaced people. Instead, they their refugee status is cast here solely on the basis of humanitarian need. And in that sense, we run into the first underlying point of tension in the relationship between Palestinian refugee communities and the UN regime as articulated via UNRWA. Palestinian refugees themselves overwhelmingly from the outset understood their refugee identity as political, as a political category, and they understood their plight as political. As such, they resisted and pushed against UNRWA's designation of their situation as something grounded only in humanitarian need. Now, of course, this is not unique to the Palestinian situation, and I doubt I need to tell this audience about that. There is a, a much uh, wider conversation that has been going on for a long time around what is sometimes called the politics of humanitarianism and what the Palestinian scholar Linda Taba calls the anti-politics of humanitarianism, whereby constructing aid recipients in this way not only depoliticizes them, but in doing so risks stripping them of the potential for political agency. We have a clear example of that here with UNRWA. But in the case of UNRWA and the Palestinian refugees, this gets even more complicated because we're not only talking about a population in need, we're also talking about a dispossessed and stateless population of the Palestinian people. So when UNRWA provides services to Palestinian refugees across the five fields, as we can see here, it, cre it increasingly over the years in the aftermath of the Nakba came to take on the guise of not only aid, but as something of a surrogate state. It did this because as the years passed and Palestinians remained in exile and the right of return while articulated by the UN was never, re was never recognized, was never realized, was never implemented. UNRWA's service model started to shift 
from the emergency relief that we saw in those early images, things like provision of rations, tents and clothing, it started to shift from that towards slightly longer term services, things that we might term less emergency aid or relief and more development. So UNRWA became really involved in setting up healthcare services, clinics, even hospitals. It set up an extensive education service that comprised primary schools, in some cases, secondary schools, that was operating across all five fields. And it became most significant and most visible in this role in the refugee camps, which you can see marked on this map here in the Maroon Triangles. Now, I should flag that it's never been the case that the majority of Palestinian refugees live in camps. Significant numbers of Palestinian refugees do not live in camps, and UNRWA also provides services to Palestinian refugees outside the camps. But the camps have long had a particular significance in UNRWA's services because, of course, these are exclusively Palestinian or majority Palestinian spaces. And these are also spaces where we see UNRWA's state surrogacy role most at play. In some camps, it even provides municipal services like rubbish collection. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this state surrogacy is because this adds a whole other dynamic to the setup I talked about, whereby UNRWA is restricting its uh, definition and its understanding of the Palestinian refugee situation and making it solely based in the concept of socioeconomic or humanitarian need. Palestinian refugees, as a result, as I said, have often pushed against this because they understand that UNRWA is in many ways the closest thing they have to some kind of state surrogate and they need it to fulfill a bigger role accordingly. This is summed up quite effectively in this line from Salah Salah, who was himself a refugee, 48 refugee from Palestine, from the Nakba, who was a leading figure in the PLO for many years and who also served as head of the PNC's refugee committee. So speaking in 2014, he told one journalist, the Jews got Israel and we got UNRWA. And although this quote might seem rather crude, it's very effective in summarizing this view of many Palestinians that UNRWA was kind of an insufficient uh, compensation prize that was given to them. In juxtaposing Israel with UNRWA here, he highlights that UNRWA is a state surrogate, but he also highlights that it's insufficient. He points to the fact that Israel is a fully fledged state by the standards of international recognition. It has territory recognized as sovereign by the world powers. It has a fully developed infrastructure and it has a powerful national army. UNRWA is state-like, but it's not a state, so it lacks any security, military, or territorial functions. It has no sovereignty. It can only function in anywhere, either at the invitation of the host states, so Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, or in the case of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, at the invitation of the occupying Israeli power. UNRWA also relies on a temporary mandate. It's only renewed every three to five years. But most critically, as I just said, the terms of UNRWA's mandate are far narrower than we would see for a state. It has no mandate for advocacy, for pursuing protection activities, or for political solutions. So the whole concept of civil and political rights that we might see in any contract between a state and its citizens is entirely absent from the UNRWA regime. Now, what makes this uh, even starker for many Palestinians is the fact that this is not only a distinction between UNRWA and states, but it's also a distinction between UNRWA and other UN bodies. Now, a point you'll often hear made, usually from anti-Palestinian actors, is that UNRWA is unique in only providing services to Palestinian refugees, whereby all other refugees in the world receive their services from UNHCR. UNHCR is the other UN agency. This is true, but if anything, it puts the Palestinians not at an advantage, but at a disadvantage, because unlike UNRWA, UNHCR does have quite a broad mandate. So UNHCR does have a mandate to pursue protection activities, and it does have a mandate to pursue political solutions to the, to the displacement, to the plights of the refugees it serves. So what's more, in saying the Jews got Israel and we got UNRWA, Salah Salah is not only highlighting UNRWA's insufficiency as a surrogate state, he's not only pointing to the anti-politics of its humanitarianism, but he's also flagging, albeit implicitly, the role of the UN in all this. 
the UN, which oversees both UNRWA and UNHCR. There is a long running view among many Palestinians that the UN bears some responsibility and even culpability for the Nakba and for their dispossession and displacement. And the logic goes that because of this, UNRWA is essentially the responsibility, uh, signifies the responsibility of the UN to provide services to them until this, this situation is resolved. Why, where does this view stem from that the UN has culpability? A lot of it has to do with the 1947 partition plan. So in 1947, the, a map of Palestine looked something like what you see here on the left. It was under the British mandate, which had been appointed by none other than the UN's predecessor, the League of Nations in 1922. Come 1947, the British, uh, in another act of colonial imperialism, handed over responsibility for Palestine to the League of Nations successor, the UN. And the UN issued its infamous partition plan, which you can see on the right here. Now, this partition plan was very contentious among many, including among Palestinians, both in its fact and in its nature. The very fact of the so-called international community, and I'll come to this in a minute, but the so-called international community seeking to carve up the land of Palestine offended many Palestinians as undermining and simply disregarding their right to national self-determination. But the details of the partition plan also caused offence because it designated 55% of Palestine to a would-be Jewish state, disregarding the fact that the Jewish population was only about a third of the total at the time. As a result, the Palestinians instead expressed a preference for what was called the minority plan, which had been put forward by a small group of states at the UN, which instead suggested a unified federation, but this was disregarded. The partition plan itself was only ever a recommendation. It was non-binding. And as we know, it was not implemented. And in the end, the state of Israel was established on 78% of the land, not 55%. But in the eyes of many Palestinians, this partition plan helped pave the way for denying their self-determination and therefore facilitated and even enabled the Nakba. This hostility and suspicion towards the UN was then compounded by the fact that while it recognized the right of return, it never took steps to implement it. And at the same time, it admitted Israel as a UN member state very early while the Palestinians themselves remained stateless. Now, all of these views have had serious uh, implications for the Palestinian refugees dynamics with UNRWA. They have pushed back against any notion that it is an aid agency or a humanitarian agency not only on the grounds that they see themselves as political refugees, but also on the grounds that it signifies the UN's responsibility for their dispossession. Now, UNRWA management and UN management have of course argued against this. They have contended that UNRWA is, because it's an international organization, it is essentially apolitical. And in this sense, they have used internationalism as a byword for neutrality and for global cooperation. But I am sure no one in this audience needs me to tell them that the concept of internationalism is in fact much more complicated and much more contested than this. Internationalism is something of a multifaceted concept with different strands to it. And we see a lot of these tensions play out in the dynamics when it comes to the UNRWA regime. So the internationalism that UN management speak of actually has often enforced not global equality or equity, but global hierarchy. We see this most obviously if we look at the UN's most senior body when it comes to world politics, the Security Council. This is the only branch of the UN that can issue binding resolutions and determine military actions, sanctions, and peacekeeping options, but it explicitly reproduces the unequal power held by the global North in international affairs because it gives superlative power to its five permanent members the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China. And so that means that while UN decisions and actions are framed as international, and we speak of the so-called international community, as I myself did so a moment ago, in practice, all of these moves are often the remit of a small group of powers that exclude the global majority. Now, we might look to the General Assembly as an alternative branch of the UN that more closely embodies the idea of international community, because it includes all UN member states and each one of them has equal representation therein. It is arguably no coincidence 
that at least since decolonization in the 60s and 70s, the General Assembly has overwhelmingly been more supportive of Palestinian rights than the Security Council has. However, at the same time, the General Assembly holds a lot less power than the Security Council. So its resolutions are non-binding, its main policy role is simply to make recommendations. But the main point for our purposes here is that the UNRWA regime and Palestinian refugee politics have always been positioned at the nexus between these two strands of internationalism at the UN. So UNRWA is mandated by and answerable to the General Assembly. It was the General Assembly that created UNRWA in 1949. But for nearly all of its history, UNRWA has received much of its funding from the same Western states that dominate the Security Council, particularly the US and the UK. So it's entwined with both strands of internationalism. And as such, the role of UNRWA really embodies these inherent tensions. What's more, even though UN management and UNRWA management have continually claimed that internationalism means its role is apolitical and neutral. In fact, we know uh, that historically and continuing into the present era, the donor states, the Western donor states, have often used their funding for UNRWA or seen their funding for UNRWA as a way to further certain political objectives in the region. In the very early period of the 1950s, UNRWA funding, uh, sorry, they funded UNRWA programs with a view to facilitating the permanent resettlement of Palestinian refugees in exile. And we can talk about this more in the Q&A if people are interested. I won't go into it here because of time. That did not work, as we know. But as time went on, nevertheless, the US and the UK made the assessment that funding UNRWA was the best way to preserve what they called, quote unquote, stability in the region. And as we moved into certainly the 21st century and particularly the last decade or so, the argument was often made by both the US and the UK that UNRWA was better than the alternatives. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because it again hits up against various discussions around the politics or anti-politics of humanitarianism. Because even those same actors who argue that, uh, that UNRWA is apolitical, who argue in favor of neutrality, are really ultimately showing in their motivations for funding it a political understanding of the role of humanitarianism. Now, what about the Palestinians themselves? Internationalism has a particular resonance when it comes to the history of Palestine, because as we've seen, so-called international action in Palestine has so often really comprised Western intervention driven by the strategic concerns of the US and the UK. And this is the same of supposedly international humanitarian intervention. But at the same time, Palestinians themselves have often engaged with the other form of internationalism that we might see more embodied by the General Assembly, if I'm putting it in slightly simplistic or reductive terms. This is the form of internationalism that aligns itself with the global south, with ideas of the global majority, with, with international transnational solidarity movements for justice and human rights, and even potentially with anti-colonialism. In this tension between different forms of internationalism, Palestinian refugee activists have continually pushed for this more anti-colonial rather than neo-colonial form of internationalism. And what's more, they've often used it to argue that their cause is actually perfectly aligned with the ideals of the UN. Now we can find examples of this at quite uh, the level of high diplomacy. So if we look at an uh, extract from Arafat's speech to the General Assembly in 1974, he presented the Palestinian struggle as very closely aligned with the UN's own norms. So he talked about it as a just and proper struggle consecrated by the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he went on to say that their struggle to their right to self-determination has been repeatedly confirmed in resolutions or adopted by this august body since the drafting of the Charter. In some ways, it might not be surprising that Arafat took this approach because at the time he was, of course, trying to gain recognition and legitimacy for the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization at the UN. But what's striking and what I found in my research is that this discourse comes up time and time again throughout Palestinian communications with the United Nations, with international actors, and it comes up in communications from the high diplomatic organized level to the grassroots. So most of the research for my book was archival. I conducted it at the UNRWA's own archive in Amman. I looked also at archives in Lebanon and um, to a lesser degree at the U in the US and the UK. 
And I supplemented all of this with testimonies and accounts from Palestinian refugees themselves. And throughout this discourse comes up time and time again. In the interest of time, I'm going to limit myself to how many examples I share, but this is one of the more grassroots cases. So this is a petition that was sent from a group of Palestinian refugees across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So we have an example of cross-field organization here, cross-Palestine organization. In 1968, they organized and sent this petition to the UN Secretary General at the time, and it made its way successfully to his office in New York. I came across it in the UN archive in New York today. I don't know how well you can all see it, and we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but what I'm really interested in drawing your attention to is the penultimate paragraph where they are condemning Israeli atrocities in the occupied territories, but they say such atrocities are in discord with all international conventions and security resolutions and the United Nations Charter. So we see this discourse coming up time and time again. And looping, linking this back to UNRWA, what this means in turn is that they see UNRWA as embedded, they have seen and they continue to see UNRWA as embedded with their cause writ large. They do not see UNRWA's um, work or their refugee status as solely about humanitarian rights, humanitarian aid or socioeconomic need. Instead, they've always interacted with UNRWA on the basis of some kind of entitlement what is sometimes referred to as performative citizenship. And accordingly, they've consistently rejected any idea that UNRWA services are aid or charity. Instead, they've argued fairly consistently that uh, the UN via UNRWA is responsible and is even compensation for having failed them in 1948. This means that its services are their rights and are not aid. And this goes hand in hand with the demand that UNRWA not stop at simply providing services, but also advocate for their political rights. In turn, therefore, UNRWA has inadvertently come to take on an added significance as a local address for the UN that many Palestinian refugees have used and continue to use to try and reach the wider world with their rights advocacy. And as a result, one of my core arguments is that the UNRWA regime that came to develop as the Palestinian refugees surrogate state is not one that was simply imposed by the international directorship of the UN, but it was rather created through continual negotiations and renegotiations between the institution, the organization, and the population it served. And before I close, I would like to show a few examples of what these demands look like in practice. So this is an extract from a document I found at UNRWA's own archive, archive in Amman. Unfortunately, this archive does not allow photos. So I have simply reproduced the line here. This was sent by a group of Palestinian refugees across a few camps in Lebanon in 1960. So in a fairly early part of the history here, although obviously at the time people had already been living in exile for more than a decade and it would not have seemed early. And this statement is telling on numerous levels. So they start off by really heavily condemning the UN, blaming it, holding it as holding it as responsible for the Nakba. They talk about the UN as a cause of the Nakba. They they betray um, serious suspicions of UNRWA and of UNRWA's motives. This connects to what I mentioned earlier about the the fact that the donor states had their own goals behind funding UNRWA, which were maybe not aligned with the Palestinians' goals. But what I'm really interested in here is the final sentence where they close off by saying the services of our agency are our rights and not favors or charity from her. So there's a very clear assertion here of ownership over the agency and of entitlement. And again, many of these themes were consistent throughout Palestinian exile across time and across space. So this is Lebanon in 1960. If we jump forward nearly two decades to the West Bank, this is a summary note from the UN's main archive in New York, and it's it's summarizing a series of communications that the Secretary General's office had received from uh, Abdullah Jabril al-Bashawi, who was the, the Mukhtar, the community leader of Balata camp in the West Bank. Uh, he was such a prolific communicator that the Secretary General's office had summarized his complaints here. Obviously, this isn't very legible. I just wanted to give you a sense of, of some of the documents. But he pops up again in UNRWA's archive. And this is um, this is a letter he wrote directly to the UNRWA Commissioner General. 
And he closes off with a very similar kind of discourse where he says, we are your responsibility and you should provide us with relief, care and services. So again, there's this very strong sense of um, entitlement and of uh, insisting that services should be cast, should be constructed as rights. Now, this follows through into the 21st century where we have seen UNRWA continually impose really severe significant cuts on its services as it has faced financial crisis after financial crisis, most uh, prolifically after the Trump administration defunded the agency in 2018, but it was certainly not limited to that. Now these cuts have caused great consternation among uh, Palestinian refugees, not only because of the fact that they are the immediate needs are not being met as a result of them, but also because there is a strong feeling that in rolling back services, UNRWA is denying Palestinians their rights. And there is a serious concern that because UNRWA is um, implicitly acknowledged as a signifier of Palestinian refugee rights, there is a long-term plan to ultimately disband UNRWA and essentially quietly forget about the Palestinians or move them to the margins of the international discourse. And so once again, Palestinian resistance, Palestinian pushback against this construction has forced a consideration of the pol politics of their cause and has rejected any suggestion that the conversation is limited to quote unquote humanitarianism in any apolitical sense. Now I'm going to wrap up here because I'm conscious of the time and I'm really keen to hear from Sasan and, and hear from all of you. There's a lot more I could say that we can come to in the Q&A. I am going to close with a shameless plug to ask some of you to buy the book and a discount code here. And I will hand back over to Sausan. Thank you for listening. You, you can keep that slide if you want. So that, okay, people, sure. yeah, for Let's a little that. bit, so people can um, take a screenshot of it or something. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Arafan. This has been um, a very, a uh, very useful, you know, overview of um, a, like something that could uh, could take hours and hours uh, to talk about. You've condensed it in in about ten uh, in about thirty minutes or so. Um, I just wanted to um, just uh, reiterate the the point that you ended with that um, in Lebanon, where where I live and work, actually last year there have been demonstrations by Palestinians in front of UNRWA offices, um, the type of demonstrations that you actually don't see by citizens, Lebanese citizens, towards their state. So uh, whenever UNRWA cuts um, on its services, like let's say um, uh, services for uh, chronic diseases or cancer treatment, that Palestinians go out and demonstrate in front of um, UNRWA offices because of that sense of entitlement that this organization is, is um uh, they have political claims or they have claims, rights and claims towards um, UNRWA. Um, I have I have one question that I wanted to start with um, as people uh, write in their questions in, um, in the Q&A section. Um, and I want to go back to the issue of uh, settlement of Palestinian refugees, whereby in, in recent years, um, at least this was my impression, UNRWA has always denied that they, um, or stated, not necessarily denied, stated that um, resettling refugees or working towards a durable solution is not part of its mandate and that they um, have never wanted to work on this. Yet in your book, you show that they actually, there's there were actually attempts to settle Palestinian refugees um, in, in um, the Arab host states that were rejected by Palestinians and by the host states. And I want to bring to your attention, I want to bring this to the current moment and bring to your attention um, a, a post on Twitter uh, that actually referenced your book um, and stated that, um, uh, you know, basically that UNRWA has been working on uh, settling the refugees and, and basically finding a solution uh, for, for the refugees. Uh, it played a role in the displacement of Palestinians into the Sinai. Um, although, on the other hand, UNRWA has been tweeting and posting 
the type of posts that are very typical humanitarian type of posts, you know, not mentioning Israeli uh, bombardment or attacks, but merely calling for um, allowing humanitarian aid to come in. Whereas Palestinians, on the other hand, have been posting uh, some uh, some statements that are condemning of UNRWA. Uh, so I would like your reflection about or your assessment of what UNRWA right now in the current moment represents um, in terms of you know this tension between humanitarianism and between uh, rights and, and protection for Palestinian refugees. Yeah, thank you, Sasan. This is a really important point. And I want to start by flagging that actually the majority of UNRWA staff, certainly at junior level, are themselves Palestinian refugees, Palestine refugees. But at a senior management level, they are all so-called internationals and, and predominantly Western Westerners. So here, when I'm talking about UNRWA, I'm really referring to, to the UNRWA management, but that is another level of tension that we often have internally between the, the Palestinian staff and the non-Palestinian management. Now, you're absolutely right that in the early period, in the 1950s, um, UNRWA was, albeit implicitly, uh, seen by the Western donor states as a key tool in trying to permanently settle the Palestinians in the host states. Uh, I mentioned in a slide on UNRWA's mandate that it was mandated to provide relief and works. This still makes up its title. It's formerly the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees. And that works, although it's basically inactive now, refers to the fact that in its early period, UNRWA's predominant focus was on jobs creations, trying to undertake job creation schemes for Palestinian refugees in the host states. And the thinking went that this was going to facilitate their long term resettlement, their permanent resettlement. Now, as you mentioned, this was overwhelmingly re uh, rejected by Palestinian refugees. It didn't really work. The work schemes were ultimately kind of quietly disbanded and reshifted its focus to education. I cover all of this in, in uh, the first chapter. But that uh, that memory stayed with the Palestinians intergenerationally, and it, and it created a lot of distrust that remains to this day. I think what is worth uh, keeping in mind is that UNRWA has... UNRWA is operating in an orbit between different uh, actors that are pulling on it, one of which is the, the Western donor states, uh, one of which is the Palestinian refugees, one of which is the Arapo states, and another one is Israel. And at various times, it has moved more into the orbit of one or another of these, um, of these actors. In the early period, it was very much in the orbit of the Western donor states. Uh, during the first intifada, we saw UNRWA probably make its most decisive move uh, towards stronger advocacy. This was when it really did um, respond quite explicit, quite definitively to Palestinian calls that it, it recognized the politics of their situation. It created new officer roles uh, specifically to document human rights abuses, and it did start undertaking some form of protection activities. However, since the first intifada, we have seen that rolled back. Uh, and in very recent years and under the current leadership, we have seen UNRWA move again very definitively more into the orbit of uh, what we could loosely term kind of the West. And as you rightly say, Sosan, it has embraced a very kind of technocratic humanitarian role, certainly with regards to the Gaza conflict, which has caused a lot of um, opposition and uh, you know outrage from Palestinians. Uh, there has particularly been uh, a lot of upset about the fact that the current commissioner general for a long time didn't even visit Gaza after the current attack began, and he then visited only for a couple of hours and then left. And he has been very um, limited in his comments and in his willingness to speak out. Uh, I don't know how much attention this has got, but I think it's worth looking into if people are interested that before the current attack started, the International Crisis Group issued a report on UNRWA's funding uh, funding future. And one comment that was made there was it said that UNRWA favored decoupling its role from the right of return. Now, I found this very interesting because UNRWA has always actually denied that it has anything to do with the right of return. But regardless, it showed a, a further move by the agency uh, away from any political advocacy role and further and further towards this technocratic humanitarian approach. And I think it is worth keeping that in mind as we look at its uh, response to the current situation. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question that is very similar also related to, um, uh, you know, uh, related to humanitarian complicity in the mm -hmm. context of the current escalation of violence in Gaza. And I want to, you know, join this with another uh, question. This this uh, question about humanitarian complicity comes from an anonymous attendee. But there's another question from Naringa to um about uh, if you can comment on the expectations uh, from the UN Secretary General. Is there anything we could expect um, them to to do in within their current mandate? The UN Secretary General, um, from what everything I have seen, has actually been more uh, outspoken than the UNRWA Commissioner General so far in terms of what he said about the attack on Gaza. Um, he obviously um, made uh, this statement, which I'm sure many people will be aware of, where he said that the October 7th attack did not happen in a vacuum, which caused um, a lot of pushback from Israel, which responded by then banning UNRWA's humanitarian representative from, sorry, the UN's humanitarian representative from entering Gaza. Um, so the Secretary General has actually, um, interestingly, really been more critical and, and, and worked more in the field of advocacy than the UNRWA Commissioner General. Um, he possibly, I'm, I'm talking here more in practical terms and less in mandate terms, but he possibly has more freedom to do so because UNRWA is constrained by the fact that it has no guaranteed funding stream. It is solely reliant on donations and many of its donations come from particularly the US, but often from other uh, European, for, European states. And because of that, the UNRWA Commissioner General is often quite reluctant to say anything to, quote, you know, to, that might be perceived as being too outspoken. The UN Secretary General does not have that constraint, although he has other constraints on him. But that being said, the UN Secretary General is also still quite limited in what actual leverage can be exerted, uh, because as I mentioned, the ones who can really exert leverage are the Security Council. And the Security Council um, has this very problematic power balance in, in who really controls controls the reins of power there. Um, since we're on this uh, topic, there is a question from Lotov. Uh, can we, sim or a comment, can we simplify a conclusion to say that UNRWA is a political organization that is responding to the political needs to keep the Palestinian cause under control by the US and the UK? So I think this is um, I think this is an interesting point. I think to some degree, I, I think to some degree, yes, but I would say it's probably not quite as simple as that because ultimately UNRWA does also serve the purpose of providing um, a flawed, limited, imperfect, but nevertheless an international recognition of the Palestinian refugees' refugee status. Um, and that is not something we should dismiss too easily. Um, the fact is that most Palestinian refugees in their protests and their activism against UNRWA have not called for it to be disbanded, they've called for it to be expanded. Um, and the fact that the not only the Trump administration, but right-wing forces in both the US and Israel have gone after Israel, have gone after UNRWA, speak to the fact that it does serve some kind of purpose through its mere existence of um, preserving Palestinian refugees, refugee uh, identity in, in the sense of international legitimacy. So even though there is a lot to criticize of it, um, it's worth noting uh, there are also these other elements at play there, and that's what causes a lot of these tensions and a lot of these dynamics. Um, this is a, a comment from uh, Dr. Jennifer Gleaning, the former director of the FXB Center. Um, uh, she's referring to the out the to UNRWA that has been hit by severe cuts by uh, by the U.S. Um, and less so, but still. Uh, uh, and, and also from other member states. And Lazzarini, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, is very committed but has to be careful not to further jeopardize agency funding. Um, his role has been forced to become more political and he has to be um, careful. Um, a, a question from the current director of FXB, Dr. Mary Bassett. Can you comment further on the importance of UNRWA as a source of jobs? 
uh, for yes. Palestinian refugees. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is a really important point, which I you know, there was a lot I had to leave out because of time. So thank you for bringing this up. So UNRWA's um, primary significance is is generally regarded in terms of its service provision, but its second uh, significance, which is also huge, is as an employer. So it is the largest single employer of Palestine refugees across the Middle East, and this role has been particularly important in Lebanon where there is um, legal discrimination against Palestinians' employment rights, and also more recently in Gaza, where the economy has been strangulated by the blockade and employment rights are very, very limited. So as I mentioned, the majority of uh, UNRWA staff, certainly at junior levels, are themselves Palestinian refugees, and UNRWA does provide you know, gainful, steady employment that is by, by Gaza or Lebanon standards uh, you know, relatively well paid. So this isn't. This was another huge impact of the um, of the Trump defunding. Not only were services cut, but there were also cuts in staff and redundancies, and many Palestinians um, lost their jobs. And this had another knock on effect. Um, so there's something interesting here, actually, that UNRWA was originally created to um, lead on these jobs creation programs, and that didn't work. But it did end up uh, doing jobs creation in another way as many Palestinians ended up finding gainful employment through working for the agency. Um, I believe from a census that was, uh, not a census, I'm sorry, a survey, a survey that UNRWA did last year um, in Lebanon, um, something like 40% of um, Palestinians who have university education uh, work with uh, with UNRWA actually. So it is it is one of the largest employers of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon at least. Um, I want to bring us, there's one question that I want to leave until the end by one of the uh, attendees, but I want to bring us back to Palestinians, uh, Palestinian refugees themselves. And um, I I have a question related to one of your books, uh, which you title From Refuge to Revolution. And I was just um, intrigued by the fact that you use the term revolution rather than resistance, because mm -hmm. in currently we only, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, we've heard the word revolution, of course, a lot in 2011 and, and later in Arab countries. But with respect to um, basically the conflict with Israel, the, the term that is used often is uh, resistance. Yeah. And I, if you can reflect on um, the current moment again and uh, what is happening in Gaza and the maybe, you know, this is just a reflection, of course, it's not requesting an answer. But what has changed that um, uh, Palestinians are using the term resistance rather than revolution? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Thank you for bringing it up. So the the chapter you're talking about uh, from refuge to revolution covers uh, the period of the late 1960s and 1970s in which um, Palestinians ousted, particularly in Lebanon, but to a lesser degree across the region, ousted the host state security forces from the camps and really took control of the camps themselves and um, really kind of rose to a new prominence across the region. And uh, under the leadership of the PLO, many Palestinians referred to this as the Thawra, the revolution, and they referred to this era as the Thawra era. And that's what I'm um, that's what I'm really referring to when I use the term revolution in that chapter and, and when I use it in that in that analysis. Um, but you're absolutely right that the lexicon um, is now much more about resistance and resistance has always really been part of the lexicon. But revolution has kind of died off. I think what's um, what's interesting here is how we might think about how this lines up with the fact that there was a period where certainly the PLO was very focused on speaking in terms of statehood. And the discourse has really shifted um, towards rights. It was, you know, at one period it was on rights, then the PLO really took it in the direction of statehood and it's gone back towards rights now. And I think you can make the case that resistance um, aligns more closely with rights and revolution is often used in a framework of statehood or in a framework of speaking about, about statehood. I think the other, factor here is that there's increasingly been um, a recognition that uh, settler colonialism is the relevant uh, framework here and is the relevant analytical tool and settler colonialism and resistance are, are often the the concepts that are used hand in hand as well so I think um 
I think that's an additional factor. And I think finally, um, it was a little bit of reflection of the times that in the, the long 1970s, where I talk about this revolution, uh, the PLO was very much aligning itself with, um, with anti-colonial movements that were taking place across the global South. And as you know, many of those anti-colonial movements were self-consciously revolutionary because they were trying to establish post-colonial statehood. We're in a different historical moment now. So I think a, a different um, framing has accordingly taken hold. Sure, sure. Okay, I, I want to mention this comment by Dr. Jennifer Leaning um, again, because it's, it's, it's only fair um, when we talk about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon to always, uh, you know, uh, mention this as well. So her comment is that in Lebanon, the Palestinians are required in general to live in camps controlled by various factions of the old PLO, highly political, heavily armed, very performative, but now creating real hardships for Le the Lebanese government and making UNRWA's job more, more difficult. So that's a comment uh, from Dr. Leaning. And then the question I want to, well, I, yes, the question I want to end with um, is comes from a, a, an anon anonymous attendee. Uh, is it all useful to think about comparing the role of UNRWA to the agencies established in the U.S. to serve Native Americans, BIA, IHS, to settler colonial situations where the oppressor is in the delicate situation of not wanting to be viewed as pursuing an annihilation project? It's a very That's loaded very yeah, that's very question. interesting. Yeah. Um, there is, as I would imagine the the questioner knows, there is um, a whole book by Stephen Salata on this comparison between uh, between Indigenous Americans and Palestinians and the two settler colonial movements. Um, I think there are definitely points of commonality, but the the Palestinians are at a different point in their struggle. And the, the Palestinians also have, there is a different situation demographically. Um, I do not know enough about the institutions mentioned there to, to, to comment on whether they would be um, an apt comparison with UNRWA. Uh, in terms of the settler colonial comparison, um, there are definitely all kinds of comparisons to be made around not only the broader theme of settler colonialism, but the way in which um, indigenous peoples across all cases of settler colonialism are often uh, not just displaced, but forced into particular demarcated areas, whether we want to call them cantons, ghettos, reservations, um, and see their mobility then restricted as a form of the control of the settler colonial state. And that is definitely a, a clear point of commonality here. Yes, um, I wrote in the chat that you referred to um, the book uh, or the work by Stephen Salaita uh, that compared uh, Palestinians with indigenous groups in the in the U.S. who was offered a position at University of Illinois, Chicago or Champaign, I don't remember, but then that offer was rescinded um, because he was attacked uh, by, by uh, the Zionist, um, uh, by Zionist groups. At that university. So um, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I I want to thank you. And uh, I, the last, actually, it's also my, my question here is, what do you most hope that readers will take away from your work? And we will, we will end with this question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that is a great question. Well, what I would really most like them to take away is really this challenging of the monolithic way in which we tend to think of Palestinian refugees in particular and refugees in general. What I've tried to show here is more of the richness and the, the full human experiences of refugees, um, the ways in which they have shaped their own experiences, the ways in which they've been constrained, the ways in which they've resisted those constraints, and the ways in which crucially they have been actors in their own history in their own stories and they are not they are people who've had things done to them but they are also people who have done things absolutely um absolutely i've read about 70 percent of the book and i can't i mean this is a, a major contribution to um the book is a major contribution to the history of palestinians in general and palestinian refugees so thank you so much 
Um, and thanks to the 80 plus uh, participants or attendees uh, who came to this webinar uh, and for the brilliant questions uh, as well. Um, thank you again, Anne, and uh, we will stay in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming and for all the questions.